Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, I am Dr. Pallavi Bajpai from Dr. D. Y. Patil Medical College and Research Center, Pimpri, Pune. The topic is joints. If you look at these pictures, the first picture is an X-ray showing you what is called as dislocation, an abnormal position of the bones of the joint. The second picture is showing you swelling of the knee joint. And the third picture is showing you abnormal positions of the joints of the hands. These two are showing a condition called arthritis. So, we are going to learn how these various conditions happen and how they are related to the anatomy of joints. I will be covering the lecture under these headings that is introduction, the definition and function the classification of joints, details about three types of joints, the fibrous, cartilage and synovial joints. I will talk about movements of joints, their blood supply, nerve supply and finally clinical anatomy. The word arthro in Greek means joints. So, what is a joint? A joint means a junction or an articulation between one bone with another bone or one bone with a cartilage or also the junction of teeth in their bony sockets. All these are joints. The joints are made in such a way or their structure is such that it allows them to resist forces which are crushing or tearing. Why do we have joints or what are the functions of joints? They allow mobility or movement in the skeleton and they also permit growth. So, how do we study joints? We study the joints by classifying them. The classification are of various types. First, we can classify the joints based on how they are constructed or what is their structure. That means, what is the material that binds the bones together and whether these joints have a cavity or not. Then we can classify them according to regional or on the basis of where these joints are located. Then we can classify them as functional classification that is based on the degree of movement allowed by each joint. In addition to this very important classification types, structural, regional and functional, we can also classify joints according to the number of bones present within the articulations. So, let us look at the first classification regional which is based on the location of the joint. So, we have three types, the joint could be a joint from the skull or it could be a joint from the vertebrae or it could be a joint from the limbs. Joints of the skull are usually immovable, joints of the vertebrae are slightly movable, but joints of the limb they allow free movement. The second classification is functional that is based on the movement. So, the joints can be classified as synarthrosis, amphiarthrosis or diarthrosis. Synarthrosis means the joint is immovable, which is commonly seen in the axial skeleton. The joint is called as amphiarthrosis when it allows slight movement. These are also seen in the axial skeleton. The joint is called as diarthrosis when it is a freely mobile joint. They are commonly found in the skeleton called the appendicular skeleton or the skeleton of the limbs. 
The important classification is this one that is the structural classification based on what material it is that binds the bones together and the presence or absence of a joint cavity. Using this classification, the structural classification, we classify joints as fibrous, cartilaginous and synovial. So, to summarize quickly, regional, functional and structural, these are the three classifications under which regional we have skull, vertebral and limb joints. Under functional, we have synarthrosis, amphiarthrosis, diarthrosis. Under structural, we have fibrous, cartilaginous and synovial. Now, we will do each one of them in detail. So, first we have fibrous joints. They are called as fibrous joints when the bones are connected by fibrous connective tissue. These joints do not have a joint cavity and they are usually immovable or very slightly movable. There are three types of fibrous joints, sutures, syndesmosis and gomphosis. So, sutures, what are sutures? Where do we get them? So, sutures are fibrous joints. They are found only in the joints of the skull. So, this is the skull and whatever joints we find here are mainly sutures. They allow bone growth that is they are primarily for growth of bone when the skull expands during childhood along with the growth of the brain. But what is important is after a certain age or after middle age this fibrous tissue which is joining the two bones on the sides this central tissue this ossifies this is called synostosis and then we say that the sutures are closed. There are various types of sutures a plain suture, a squamous suture, serrate suture, a dentate suture and a shindelysis. So, what is a plain suture? A plain suture is when the two bones are joined by a fibrous tissue and the surfaces of the two bones are almost vertical opposing each other. Example is intermaxillary suture, interpalatine suture and palatomaxillary suture. Then we have the squamous suture. A squamous suture is when the opposing surfaces of the bone are sloping. Then it forms a squamous suture. Example, the anterior parietotemporal suture. Serrate suture. So, from the name and the word serrate which means zigzag, it means that the two bones which are forming the joint have a very irregular and serrate surface examples the sagittal suture and coronal suture. Then dentate, from the word dentate we can understand that the adjoining surfaces of the bone are interlocking with the shape like tooth like shaped surfaces, example lambdoid suture. The last one the shindelysis, it is a special suture seen between the rostrum of the sphenoid and the upper border of the bone woma. Next we come to the second type of fibrous joint called syndesmosis. In syndesmosis the bones are joined together by ligaments or membranes. Example we have the joint between the shaft of radius and the shaft of ulna by a structure that is the interosseous membrane and this joint is a syndesmosis. In a similar fashion, we have a joint between the lower end of tibia and the lower end of fibula, the inferior tibiofibular joint that is also a syndesmosis. Then we come to the next type that is gomphosis. Gomphosis means it has a peg and socket arrangement. So, we have the tooth which is fitting into the socket called the alveolar socket which is present in the jaw bone and it is connected by a fibrous ligament called the periodontal ligament. So, second variety of joints now the cartilaginous joints. 
in cartilaginous joints the bones they are connected by a plate of cartilage. So, there is no cavity here we have the bones and we have the cartilage plates in between, but no cavities. These cartilaginous joints they are of two varieties primary cartilage joint and secondary cartilage joint. Primary cartilage joint is also called synchondrosis and the secondary cartilage joint is called symphysis. So, the primary cartilage joint or the synchondrosis in which we have two bones joined by a plate of cartilage. These joints are immovable, they allow growth and they are temporary. That means, after some years the cartilage plate is replaced by bone. This procedure in which the cartilage plate is replaced is replaced by bone is called synostosis. Examples the epiphyseal plates seen in small children between the ends of long bones. This is an example of primary cartilage joint and also the joint between costal cartilage of first rib and sternum. Secondary cartilage joints called symphysis. Here we have the bones which are covered by hyaline cartilage and in between them we have a fibrocartilage disc or a pad of fibrocartilage. These are permanent joints, they are present throughout life. They are amphiarthrotic and they are for strength, flexibility along with growth. Example, intervertebral joints between the vertebrae formed by the intervertebral disc and the pubic symphysis. Now, here we have to remember that there is another joint called symphysis menti, but that is not a secondary cartilage joint. So, fibrous joints are sutures, gomphosis, syndesmosis, sutures are plain, squamous, serrate, denticulate, shindelysis, cartilaginous joints are primary and secondary. Now, we come to the synovial joint. The synovial joint is the most evolved joint and the most mobile joint. Most of the joints in our body are synovial joints. They have the bones as you can see and the bones are covered by articular cartilage. The bones are joined together by a thick fibrous tissue which is called as the capsule. So, within the capsule and between the bones is a space and that space is called as joint cavity. So, synovial joints have a joint cavity. The inside of the capsule is lined by a membrane called synovial membrane. This joint cavity in synovial joints is filled with a fluid called synovial fluid which is lubricating and nutritive in function. The fibrous capsule is richly innervated, it is very sensitive to stretch which is imposed by movements. The fibrous capsule on the outer aspect is reinforced by ligaments and ligaments can be true ligaments or accessory ligaments. True ligaments are those when they are the thickening of the fibrous capsule and they can be intracapsular or extracapsular and accessory ligaments are those which are placed away from the capsule. In addition, synovial joints show some additional features bursae and tendon sheaths. What are bursae and tendon sheaths? If you look at this picture, this is a tendon, this is the bone and in between we are finding this structure which is like a bag. Here again this is the bone, this is another bone and this is the tendon and we are seeing another tendon passing down covered by a bag like structure filled with fluid. So, these bursae and tendon sheaths, they are closed bags made up of synovial membrane filled with synovial fluid. They are there to reduce friction. The bursae are flattened fibrous sacs lined by synovial membrane 
and tendon sheaths are elongated bursa that wrap themselves around a tendon. What are the factors which affect the stability of a synovial joint? The main factor is muscle. It is most important and it is an indispensable factor. The tone of different groups of muscle which act on a joint help to maintain its stability. Second are ligaments. They are important for stability and preventing excessive movements. They guard against any sudden accidental excessive movement. But once they are stretched, they are no longer helpful because they remain in that elongated position. Bones. Bones are important in special joints where their shape helps to make the joint secure like a hip joint. Whereas, other, in other joints they do not play much role. Synovial joints can be classified according to the degrees of freedom. They can be classified into plane joint, uniaxial, biaxial and multiaxial. And according to their complexity, we can classify them into simple, compound and complex. So, first we will do the complexity of organization. Simple joints are those when the joint has only two articular surfaces. So, if we look at this picture of a joint, there are two articular surfaces. This is a simple synovial joint. Example, shoulder joint. Then compound joint. It is a joint which has more than two articular surfaces. So, looking at this picture, we can see one bone, then we can see another bone and we can see another bone. So, whenever we have more than two surfaces articulating, it is called as a compound joint. Example, elbow joint. Then we have a complex joint. It is a joint when the space of the joint has been divided into two compartments with the help of an intra-articular disc. So, if we look here, this is the bone above, this is the bone below, we have a joint space and in between the joint space is a disc. The disc is dividing the joint space into an upper and lower compartment. Example of such a joint is temporomandibular joint. Now, we come to the classification of synovial joints according to degree of freedom of movement. So, the first one is a plane joint or a non-axial joint. The second is uniaxial third is biaxial and fourth is poly or multiaxial. A non-axial plane allows only gliding movement. A uniaxial joint allows movement around a single axis. A biaxial joint allows movement along two axes and polyaxial allows around three axes. So, we will do them one by one. So, the first joint plane joint. It is a non-axial joint. The articular surfaces are flat and opposing each other and the movement is gliding movement. Example, intercarpal joints and intertarsal joints. Then coming to uniaxial joints. The first variety is the hinge joint. In hinge joints, one end of the bone looks like a cylindrical end or a pulley shaped end and the other end of the bone, the other bone looks like a trough. They both fit into each other and movement is allowed in one plane. So, it is a uniaxial joint and the movement is allowed in transverse axis. Examples, the elbow joint, the ankle joint, and interphalangeal joints. The second type of uniaxial joint is a pivot joint or a trochoid joint. Here again the movement is in one axis only, but it is a vertical axis. So, the bone it rotates along the long axis. Example, 
the superior and inferior radio ulnar joint and the joint between atlas and axis which is the median atlanto axial joint. Then we come to biaxial or when there are two axes. The first variety is called condyloid joint. Now, in condyloid joint the articular surfaces have got a male convex surface, a female concave surfaces which are called condyles and the movement occurs around two axes. So, we can see one axis and we can see another axis. So, the movement occurs along a transverse axis and a vertical axis. Examples of such joints are the knee joints which allows two types of movements flexion and extension in one and rotation in the other axis. The second variety of biaxial joint is the ellipsoid joint. Now, here the articular surfaces have one oval convex surface and one elliptical concave surfaces fitting into each other. The movements occur along two axes here mainly the transverse axis and the antero posterior axis. This kind of joint is seen in the wrist joint and the metacarpo phalangeal joint. Now, we come to the third variety that is the multi-axial joint. There is a first type of multi-axial joint, it is called as saddle joint. Here we have to understand and remember the movement is occurring under along three axes. So, here the articular surfaces have a concave and convex surface on both sides, a concave or convex surface on both sides. Therefore, there is main movement in two axes and a slight movement in a third axis also. Example, the thumb joint or the first carpometacarpal joint. So, the movements in this joint are flexion extension on one axis, adduction abduction in the second axis and a conjunct rotation with the movements very slight rotation. The other such joints are the sternoclavicular joint and the joint between femur and patella. The second variety of multi-axial joint is the ball and socket joint. Here we have a nice spherical head which fits into a concave socket of the other bone allowing free movement in three axes. So, we can see in the diagram we have three axes of movement flexion extension in one axis, adduction abduction in the other axis, rotation in the third axis and combination of all these movements called circumduction can also occur. Where do we get such joints? We get them in the shoulder and the hip joint. So, when we studied the classification of synovial joint, we have to remember there are four varieties, plain, uniaxial, biaxial, multiaxial. Plane is only one type, uniaxial are of two varieties, hinge and pivot, bioaxial are of two varieties, condyloid and ellipsoid and multiaxial are of two varieties, saddle and ball and socket. Now, we have to understand movements of joints. There are three basic types of movements in any joint, either they may be gliding or they may be angular or they may be rotation movement. So, if we look at this picture here, we can understand gliding movement. In gliding movement, the flat surfaces of bones, they glide over each other and we can see such gliding movement in carpals, articular processes of vertebrae and tarsals. Then angular movements. In angular movements, there is always an increase or decrease of angle between the concerned bones. Therefore, we may have the movement flexion, extension, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, abduction, adduction, and circumduction. 
these are the moments which are angular in nature. So, looking at the pictures, this we can see this movement in which it, the angle between the face and the chest is decreased, this is flexion, then we have extension, then we have flexion of the upper limb, we have flexion of the lower limb, we have extension of the lower limb and extension of upper limb. We have abduction that means we move the arm away from the body or we have erduction we move the arm towards the body sorry. We have erduction in which we move the arm towards the body and abduction in which we move the arm away from the body and a combination of them called as circumduction which is a circular movement. We have the movement rotation in which the there is rotation of the bone around along its long axis between C1, C2 or we may have rotation in the hip joint or the shoulder joint. We have some special movements supination and pronation. These are movements of the forearm and hand. In supination the forearm rotates laterally such that the palm is facing up. In pronation the forearm rotates medially such that the palm is facing down. Then we have the movement of the foot called dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Dorsiflexion is lifting the foot so that the dorsal surface is approaching the shin and plantar flexion is such that we depress the foot and the toes are pointing down. Then we have the movement inversion and the movement eversion. In inversion the sole of the foot faces medially, in eversion the sole of the foot faces laterally. We have some movements of the jaw called protraction in which the jaw moves outwards and forwards and retraction when the jaw moves backwards. We have the movement elevation in which we close the mouth or lift the jaw and depression in which we open the mouth or the jaw comes down. We have a special movement of the thumb which is called as opposition in which the thumb touches the tips of other fingers. Now we come to blood supply of a joint. The blood is supplied to a joint through the periarticular plexus that is the articular branches and the epiphyseal branches. These branches they perforate the fibrous capsule and a plexus is formed in the deeper parts of the synovial membrane. Then these blood vessels they terminate around the articular margins in a looped manner which is called as circulus articularis vasculosis. This circle supplies the capsule, the synovial membrane and the epiphyses. The articular cartilage is avascular. So, this is important to remember that the articular cartilage does not get any blood supply. After the fusion of epiphyses, there is a communication between this arterial circle and the end arteries of the metaphysis. Nerve supply, the capsule and ligaments of every joint are richly supplied by nerves, they are sensitive to pain. But the synovial membrane has a poor nerve supply. The articular cartilage is totally not supplied by nerve, it is non-nervous and hence insensitive to pain. Now the nerves which are called as the articular nerves, they contain sensory fibers and autonomic fibers. The sensory fibers are proprioceptive that means they are sensitive to the position and the movement of the joints, they are concerned with the reflex control of posture and locomotion. Some sensory fibers are those which are related to pain. 
the autonomic fibers they are vasomotor in nature. The nerve supply is governed by two laws the Hilton's law and Gardner's law. If you look at this diagram this is a joint these are the bones in the joint this is the capsule of the joint and here we can see the muscles and we have the overlying skin and you can appreciate this the nerves which are supplying the muscle also and the capsule of the joint as well as the skin. So, the first law states that a motor nerve to a muscle acting on the joint tends to give a branch to that joint and another branch to the skin covering the joint. So, that we can see very clearly the nerve is supplying the muscle, it is supplying the joint and it is supplying the skin. The second law Gardner law states that each nerve which innervates a specific region of the capsule and that part of the capsule which is rendered tight by a given muscle is innervated by the nerve supplying its antagonist. This pattern of innervation is important because it is concerned with the maintenance of efficient stability of the joint. Now, we come to clinical anatomy. Joints because they are all the time in use they are prone to traumatic stress and because of their function of mobility, growth etcetera they are subject to wear and tear and friction every day. They can also be affected by inflammatory processes and degenerative processes. So, first condition that we would like to know is the neuropathic joint. A neuropathic joint is a joint where there is no nerve supply. Hence, all reflexes are lost, the joint is unprotected and therefore, it is liable to mechanical damage. The affected neuropathic joint shows swelling, excessive mobility and destruction. It is caused by leprosy, tabes dorsalis and syringomyelia. Then commonly we hear the word sprains. What is a sprain? When the ligaments which are reinforcing a joint, they are stretched or torn then that is called as a sprain. The symptoms of a sprain are pain, redness, swelling and restriction of movement. When these ligaments which have been stretched, if they are partially injured or partially torn, they can slowly repair themselves. But if they are completely torn, then they require surgical treatment. Coming back to that same picture which we had seen right in the beginning, what is this condition? This is the condition called as dislocation when the bones are forced out of their normal position. This can happen when a person has a serious fall and this is often seen in sports injuries. When this displacement is not complete or it is partial, then we use the word subluxation. Inflammatory conditions and degenerative conditions. The first one is bursitis. It is inflammation of the bursa around a joint. It can happen due to an injury or it can happen due to overuse and friction. The signs and symptoms of bursitis are pain and swelling around a joint. We can also have a condition tendinitis in which the inflammation of the tendon sheaths occurs. This is usually due to overuse and here also the symptoms are same pain and swelling around a joint. Then we have the condition called arthritis. Arthritis is a most common condition. It is a very crippling condition. It causes pain, stiffness and swelling of a joint. It can occur in various forms acute and chronic that means severe or long drawn out and it can have various reasons. We can have osteoarthritis, we can have rheumatoid arthritis, we can have gouty arthritis. So, rheumatoid arthritis the one shown in this picture it is an autoimmune condition 
there is inflammation of the synovial membranes and therefore there is erosion of the cartilage of the joints. This results in ankylosis or stiffness of joints, joints become bent and deformed. This happens during the between the age of 40 to 50 but may uh, can occur during any age. This picture is showing osteoarthritis. This is the condition osteoarthritis. As one ages, the cartilage in the joints is damaged more than it is replaced. Therefore, the ends of bones get exposed, they become enlarged, they form what we call as spurs. So, if you see this x-ray, this is the patient and this is the x-ray of both the knees, you can see the irregularities and projections, these are called as bony spurs, they restrict movement. Joints affected usually are of the neck region, the back, the fingers, knuckles, knees, hips. So, this is osteoarthritis. Then gouty arthritis, it is classically seen at the joint of the base of great toe. So, the joint of the base of the great toe, it presents as a reddish swelling and painful movement of the great toe. It is due to deposition of uric acid crystals in the soft tissues followed by inflammation. To summarize, articulations can be from bone to bone, bone to cartilage, cartilage to cartilage. Joints are for only growth, movement or both growth and movement. They can be fibrous, cartilaginous and synovial. The movements of the joints depends upon their shape, their structure, their mobility and the movements are either gliding, angular or rotational. There are various types of movements, flexion, extension, adduction, abduction, rotation, circumduction, pronation, supination, inversion, eversion, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. Diseases and conditions of joints are sprain, dislocation, arthritis and they all commonly cause pain, swelling, restriction of movement of the joint and may also cause deformity. With that, we come to the end of the topic. Thank you.